Hello, Elaine. Good evening. Hi, Laura. You're on. Right. Yeah, just realised I was busy typing away. Someone was asking a question about consultation on social media, so I was just responding to that quickly. Yeah. Um, we are sending the MRC uh, response out this evening. Just so as you know, um, so. once I've got Mark sign off. Got the TCAG one. I just need to put the finishing touches to my personal response. <laughs> ah, right. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, it was aided by your 92 questions. <laughs> I hope they helped and weren't a hindrance of just clogging up your inbox. I just thought it may be helpful to see what we were uh, asking and see what they were responding. Well, we covered quite a few of them anyway. Um, but they were a useful check, that's for sure. Good. I do try and help. I'm not <laughs> when I send emails. Good evening, everyone. Are we ready to start? Yeah. Just got the sign off from Mark, so that will go out this evening once I've finished. Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting of the we're Lower Thames Crossing for our Task Force. We're prepping ISHs this week, so. I'm attending the first one. I'm going to prep for that tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Uh, yeah. Dem Services um, is well, trying to start the meeting. Both, so we're not going to the open floor hearings, obviously. Uh, but I guess you guys are. Can you not hear us online? Um, yeah, I'm registered for the all sit one online. Chris, yeah. Laura. Sorry, yeah. we're trying to start the meeting. Is it okay if we take this offline, please? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I, we were waiting <laughs> for you to, to speak. Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force. Please be aware that the meeting is being live streamed and the recording will be made available on the Council's website. I will move to the agenda, item number one, to acknowledge any apologies. I haven't received any apologies, but Councillor Piccolo isn't here at the moment. Item two of the agenda is the nomination of the Chair. Can I please have any nominations for the Chair? nominate myself. So we have two nominations, Councillor Massey and Councillor Neil Spade. No, 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 no. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Don't have a second nomination? Thank you. So we only have one nomination and I'd like to announce that Councillor Massey is the chair. Elaine, just to let you know, we don't have a view of the room at all. It's a wall we're seeing. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, uh, let's see where we are on the agenda. Um, okay, next item three, nominations for vice chair. Can I have any nominations for vice chair, please? I'd like to nominate Councillor Mel Downey. And someone to second that? I'd like to second that. Councillor Spate and uh, Robert Quick. Um, I therefore um, nomination of Vice Chair of Councillor Muldoon. Anyone else? Then Councillor Muldoon is the Vice Chair. Thank you. Item four, the minutes. Um, I move that the minutes of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force meeting held on the 20th of March 2023 be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? Councillor Arnold. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, obviously, first meeting, um, I'm reading through the minutes. Um, just got a little point here I'd like to clarify or just get some kind of uh, explanation for, if I can, please. Uh, it's page six on the agenda. Um, and it's midway down the second paragraph, um, and it's regarding the, uh, the accounting officer assessment. And it said that, um, that the TCAG had actually entered a freedom of request information, and the Cabinet had refused to get access to that. Can I just get a little update on what's happening there and what the circumstances are behind that, please? Uh, Mark Bradbury, would you like to come in there? I'm 
trying to find the correct page in the minute. Could you repeat? Oh, it's on page six of the agenda, so that, that's the only copy I've got at the moment. Um, just just a, a point from Laura and myself. We cannot hear what's going on and we cannot see what's going on. Shall we adjourn for five minutes, see if we can work out this technical thing? Meeting adjourned five minutes. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Thank you. Laura and Chris, can you can you see and hear me? I can hear you, um, Fraser, but I can't see you. I can, I can hear you just about then, but previously I was struggling to hear what was happening in the room. I didn't hear the previous councillor's question, for instance. I may not need to, but it's helpful to understand. Hey, Would it help Anyone to turn the laptop around, Elaine, to aim it towards the room rather than you? Yeah, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Right. It, it shouldn't be coming off your laptop. It should be coming off the the camera on the live feed which is what we're getting, um, but they're not getting. So I don't know. I've there is an option to reverse the camera, Elaine. That helps. Chris, can you hear me? I... I I can't see anyone except Elaine at present. No, uh, can you hear me though, Chris? It's Mark. I can just about hear you now. Yes, I can. Okay. It, it, it shouldn't be coming off Elaine's laptop. It should be coming off a larger camera. Um, so yes. turn, turning her laptop round isn't going to solve it. Um, Fair enough. Okay. Uh, no problem. All right. Well, let's, let's press on then. Sorry. If, if I can hear, that's a start. Yes. You probably could only see the person that's speaking. Laura, can, can you hear me okay? And well, I don't know if you can see me now. I'm not sure if you were asking if I can hear you. I can barely hear you. I think that was Councillor. I think I heard that you were talking about minutes and that's why I wanted to pop my hand up just to say that I had actually emailed some amendments for the minutes if that's helpful. <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna to start the meeting again. Um, Laura, we'll, we'll try and speak up to make it better if you can hear. So if this will be a good test. Um, you had some comments on the minutes, Laura. I think you're asking if I had comments on the minutes. Yes, I'd like to confirm that I did have, which I emailed through, because there were a few of them, and I felt rather than go through all of them in the meeting, it would be easier to email them to the committee in advance. Thank you. Yes, I saw, saw those, and um, we'd, we'll bring those in if we confirm these minutes. And also, Councillor... Arnold had a question. I don't want to try and re-ask that, Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, really, it's just uh, regarding page six. It's, it's a little way down on the second paragraph. Um, and it's just referring to an independent assessment review um, that the, the TCAG had actually requested a freedom of information request. Um, and it said that the, uh, it's been refused by Cabinet. I was wondering if you could just expand on that for me. Obviously, I'm a new member on the committee. I was just wondering what the background to that is, please. Yeah. 
No, so I think you're asking for clarification about the freedom of information that we put into the infrastructure and infrastructure and projects authority. Um, and that was regarding some independent reviews that were carried out that were mentioned in the LTC accounting officer assessment, which is a document that is meant to offer transparency and guidance to ministers that are making decisions about spending significant amounts of public money. The inter, uh, we requested the copies of those independent reviews um, to the IPA and the IPA falls under the remit of the Cabinet Office and the Treasury. The Cabinet Office responded to say that they were refusing it. We actually requested an internal review. Um, well, actually, Lee Day were instructed to request that internal review for us. And at that point, um, they actually ended up being in breach of legislation because they didn't respond by the statutory deadline. Since then, we have actually instructed Lee Day again, and they have put a complaint into the Information Commissioner's Office. So we are waiting further information back from Lee Day on our behalf to see what happens ongoing on that. I hope that helps. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Any other members wish to make comments on the minutes? Chair, if I may, I'm not a member, I appreciate, but in the light of that question, the minute probably needs altering to say she stated that the request had been refused by Cabinet Office. At the moment, it says Cabinet, which is, I think, where the confusion arose. So it is not the Council's Cabinet that's refused the request, it's Cabinet Office. So if the minute could be amended to clearly say that, that will evolve avoid anybody else having the same issue. I think that's a, a fair suggestion that should clear things up and any, uh, not lead to any confusion. Um, democratic services, could we um, please ensure that the minutes that Laura sent over and circulated are corrected on the final record that we... Brilliant. Thank you. I move that these minutes be approved as a correct record. Um, urgent items of business. I've not agreed to any items of urgent business this evening. Uh, item six, declarations of interest. Does anyone uh, wish to declare a declaration of interest? I was just trying to make a point um, then, and I think it's something that procedurally that as a council we need to do um, when we confirm a decision, uh, Mr. Chairman. And what you just said was, was very eloquent and to the point, um, but I think you would need to say that you need to have subject to the addition of those in your formal recommendation for approval. As a council, if you read the BBR, an enormous number of decisions are not put down with the clarity that they need to be and the exactness that they need to be. And I think as we're the first committee meeting, or first group meeting rather, not a committee, after the BBR, we should set an example that others should follow and be absolutely precise in recommendations the statements that we make to the Democratic Services Officer President. Sorry to be pedantic, but I think it's really important. Uh, thank you, Councillor Spate. So just to clarify, we're going to agree that the minutes are be uh, adopted, but with the changes that Laura Blake had circulated on email, and with the changes that um, the Officer Mark Bradbury has suggested as well regarding clarifying the Cabinet position. Um, all members in agreement with those, please raise your hands. And to the contrary, thank you, members. Does anyone wish to declare a declaration of interest? No. Brilliant, thank you. Moving on to item seven. It's a verbal update on the development control order, pre-examination process, and next steps. Uh, Mark Bradbury, can uh, you please provide an update to task force? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, you'll notice that uh, Chris Stafford is um, one of those who's been struggling to hear or see us, but he is a member of the team. Those of you who've been on the panel um, or the task force for a while will, will know Chris. Uh, for those of you who haven't, um, Chris is a key part of the external team that has been advising uh, the task force up to now and is now part of the team that is uh, making the uh, submissions to the examination process. Um, it's a verbal update primarily because we are now in a very fast moving uh, stage of the process. Um, the, um, 
DCO or the development control order was accepted uh, by uh, the planning inspectorate uh, in October last year. Um, the uh, timetable uh, for the remaining phase of it uh, was set out in a Rule 6 um, notice from the uh, examining authority. It's for those who haven't been involved in uh, DCOs or development control orders before. Um, uh, the, the panel that sit and make recommendations to the Secretary of State are called the examining authority, known for short as the XEXA. Uh, there is a lead panel member and a number of other panel members that sit. Most of the correspondence comes from the lead uh, panel member. And now that we are in the um, pre-examination stage for the rest of today and the examination stage from tomorrow, all of the correspondence that uh, we receive or submit is now available on the PINS website. So if you ever at any stage want an update uh, or want to point uh, members of the public or businesses to where the current position is, um, I recommend you direct them to that uh, website for the most up-to-date information on where the uh, examination is progressing and, and what Thurrock Council has submitted. Uh, there are a lot of documents on there, um, but they're reasonably easy to find if you go into the search box and type in Thurrock Council. Um, so that's a, a sort of a bit of help for those who haven't been involved in the process so far. Um, when I last presented to you in March, shortly before the um, pre-election period, um, we mentioned that we um, uh, had uh, re-engaged or were in the process of re-engaging the team of external consultants that has been advising us. Uh, they had been uh, put on uh, a brief pause while we reviewed the impact of Section 114 notice on our ability to uh, progress our uh, positioning with the examination and also while we negotiated an improved planning performance agreement. Um, again, for the benefit of those who are new to the task force, um, the Council has been um, uh, challenging, uh, I think is probably the appropriate expression, uh, National Highways and the LTC uh, Lower Thames Crossing team uh, for a considerable period of time. And some of the costs of our doing that had been covered by a previous planning performance agreement between the Council and National Highways, which set out wi what they would pay for. That um, um, planning performance agreement came to an end with the acceptance of the development control order by the planning inspectorate. So it was necessary for us to negotiate a new one. And we have pushed hard for better terms for Thurrock residents. Um, there is still a cost uh, to the council in representing itself through the process because um, National Highways will still not pay legal costs associated with the process. Uh, our representation at the examination itself, it will pay for reports that we present, but it won't pay for all of the representation. And it certainly will, they will certainly not pay for uh, King's Council uh, <laughs> representing us where we need that um, uh, legally nuanced response. But we do have uh, a, an agreement on a planning performance agree agreement, um, if that's not alliteration, um, uh, that is better than we previously had and is better than any other authority um, involved in the process. And, and that in itself has raised some, some questions with others. Um, which um, the examining authority has batted straight back to them to take up with National Highways. Um, but I, I'm pleased that we have been able to reduce the cost of our representation to the council and thus the <laughs> residents through our negotiation. Um, in, in the light of that um, uh, delay to our progressing some of the work to prepare for the examination, um, we did submit, um, and I mentioned at the last meeting that I had submitted a uh, request to delay the process uh, by approximately three months. Um, that uh, request was accepted the following day, on the 21st of March, 
Um, so it was recognised that we had requested that and was the subject of um, discussion at a subsequent programming meeting, uh, which uh, some of you may have joined online, and again at a preliminary meeting on the 6th of June. Um, in the meantime, we also submitted uh, our responses to a number of procedural deadlines. Again, I'm not going to go into detail of what was submitted. They are all clearly on the PIMS website, and Chris can answer any questions about the detail of that, but it's pretty clear. But procedural deadline A, which was the 10th of May, we met uh, and our submission was made and accepted. Procedural deadline B, um, uh, which was the 31st of May, um, we submitted our response and that was accepted and published shortly afterwards. Procedural deadline C, we actually submitted two responses, a detailed response and then a supplementary following discussion at the preliminary meeting and the procedural me programming meeting. So um, we have been responding in the meantime while we awaited a decision on whether the timetable for the examination uh, was going to be extended. And I have to say that during the process and certainly during the programming meeting and the preliminary meeting, we were feeling reasonably optimistic and that we were getting some, some uh, positive contact from the panel. However, when the um, uh, procedural decision was released on the 15th uh, of June last Thursday, we were disappointed to hear that they had decided um, not to allow additional time and to stick to the original timetable. Um, so um, the examination starts officially tomorrow. Um, we will, as Chris was mentioning briefly while he was chatting at the beginning, uh, we will be submitting a response to a minor refinement cons consultation tonight, uh, and then we move into the next steps uh, of the examination. That will run through for six months, so from the 20th of June through to the 20th of December. There are, uh, the, the examining authority have effectively boxed themselves into that timetable now because it, it is a requirement for them to deliver their recommendations uh, uh, to complete the examination uh, and then proceed to deliver their recommendations within that time scale. Um, again, uh, personally, I think they will find that challenging to them as much as it is to us, um, but we will uh, do what we can to make sure that we meet the ongoing deadlines. So in terms of next steps, um, there is an open floor hearing tomorrow. Um, open floor hearings are an opportunity for other interested parties who've submitted their representations to present their case. It's time limited for each of them. I think from memory they get about five minutes each to, to present to the examining authority their case. Um, there are further open floor hearings on the 28th of June, and if there is anybody uh, who wants to register who is listening uh, for that, they can register by Thursday the 22nd of June if they want to be heard at that. And a further one on the 5th of July, and the registration date for that is the 29th of June. But to be clear, you have to have already submitted your representations to then register to be able to talk those through. So that's, those are the next meetings um, that are open to a wider audience. Um, there are issue-specific hearings um, this week, uh, 21st of June, on the project definition. So the opportunity for uh, those who've made representations to question whether the project is properly defined, fully defined. Um, and then on the 22nd, the following day, there's an issue-specific hearing uh, around the, the draft development control order itself, so in effectively the draft planning consent as to whether uh, there are representations on what is included within that. And we will be represented by our team at both of those. Um, the next procedural deadline is procedural deadline D, which is the 18th of July. Um, and we're currently uh, looking at uh, what our responses are for that, although a lot of that will emerge over the course uh, of, the, uh, of the next few weeks. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole of the program. Um, the uh, Rule 6 uh, statement uh, that was made earlier in the process, um, now the timetable within that still remains the same. 
there have been there might be some minor tweaks going forwards but if you want to see what the rest of the timetable is it is published um, um, on the on the pins or planning inspectorate website um, um, what I suggest is that at a uh, at a future meeting we then go through the next stage rather than focus on the whole of it for now um, but I'm uh, I'm happy or Chris will be happy to uh, uh, expand upon that um, you may want to consider bearing in mind that we are now in a very tight time scale uh, most of my team uh, will be heavily involved um, in meeting all of these deadlines making sure that all of the supplementary uh, reports um, that we need to present our evidence are um, uh, done on time to enable us to put in those uh, responses to the various procedural deadlines um, I'm very happy to update you on a monthly basis but actually it is going to be verbal simply because of the fluid nature um, and uh, in most cases I'll be referring you to documents um, that have been published um, you may therefore want to consider whether you want to continue to meet monthly I'm happy for you to do so but as I say as far as a task force goes there aren't actually many tasks for you at this stage it's now making sure that you're up to speed with where the process is uh, being satisfied that the council is continuing to raise its um, concerns about the lack of mitigation for a range of issues that impact on um, Thurrock residents and businesses most of which you will know far better than I if you've been on this panel uh, on this task force for a while uh, simply because uh, your engagement with it's been over several years whereas mine's been over several months but as I say, the positive news is that, the, that with one or two exceptions where we're still sorting out some procurement issues that are historic, um, the vast majority of the team are back and working and there are certainly no absences that are currently uh, holding us up in terms of being properly represented. Um, and we will do our best in the timetable that has been set. We haven't got the extension we would have liked to do even better, but we will do our best will be re well represented and it is noted uh, and again those of you who uh, um, attended um, or watched the preliminary meeting will be well aware that the likes of DP World um, the action group uh, even Kent County Council um, were uh, very keen to ensure that Thurrock as the largest impacted authority was allowed to be properly represented at the um, examination uh, finally I, I referred to the planning performance agreement um, that is in an agreed form now um, and um, uh, will go to cabinet uh, in July as part of an update paper uh, on the process um, to seek approval for us to sign that uh, at the moment both parties are behaving as if it were in place and therefore, even though it's not signed, um, uh, National Highways have said that they will honour any expenditure in the meantime. Uh, and that also refers to the period back to October where we haven't had a, 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 a planning performance agreement in place. And um, I was able to get them to confirm that on the record in one of the meetings. So um, uh, we, we've got that noted by the examining authority. So that's a canter through where we've been and where we're going. As I say, I just reiterate that we've, we've got both an internal and external team spending a considerable amount of time over the next few months making sure we are well represented. It will, as we set out in the draft cabinet paper, uh, have some impacts on some of the other things that our planning team uh, may have to sort of deprioritize over the next couple of months. Um, but um, we will make sure that uh, the hard work that the task force together with the likes of Chris and uh, Colin who, uh, and others who've been involved uh, and Laura and her team um, is not lost by us not uh, proceeding to be well represented throughout the examination process. Thank you very much. Um, is there any comments or questions from members?
Councillor Mulroney. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for that report. Can I ask what the reason was given for um, not granting an extension? They are set out in the letter, and if you'll bear with me, I can read them out verbatim, but they're in there. Uh, I think they're quite weak. I think basically what they're saying is, now that you've got a PPA agreed, what's the problem? And I'm paraphrasing enormously, but uh, it, it's not much more than that. Uh, the view is that um, we had been on pause. We now have most of the team back working. We have a planning performance agreed. All of these processes are very tight, and therefore we should just get on with it. Um, now, whether that is something that could be challenged at a later date, we'll wait and see. But we, we as I say, we presented, in my view, a, a, a strong case, uh, a very clear case. And in fact, the letter clarifies that we, we, we did do that um, and, and almost credits us for doing that, but then goes on to say it doesn't outweigh the um, wider interest in getting this decision um, um, made. Um, we, we did challenge why the urgency, bearing in mind that government already said they weren't going to start it for two years. Um, and yes, I could understand from their perspective that the decision is not the end of this because then you've got the um, section 106 agreement which the process will define the heads of terms of but then we've got to go on and finalize and then there are the reserve matters so i can understand why national highways would want it still to be determined early but i don't think there was a compelling need um, we put a good case forward um, but in the end their view was we've set the program you've now got the money agreed you've got your team back on board get on with it Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I was going to make that point about the fact that <laughs> it's going to be delayed for two years, you know, anyway. So it just seems rather, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Rather sort of stubborn to keep to the to the timetable, given given the situation. Um, but there's, I, there's nothing that we can do about that, I guess. You did say that, that there may be opportunities later on in the process. Can you say a bit more about that? I mean, I think there's two elements to that. One is that I think they, they will find as it goes that they will come under pressure. And it was interesting that at the um, preliminary meeting, even National Highways said that they were going to struggle with one of their, one of their own deadlines. Um, and I think, it, you know, it might be that the programme is reviewed part way through. I think the examining authority will be very loath to do that. But clearly, if they cannot complete their own side of the process, they may do that. Um, but then, of course, there is always the prospect of a, a judicial review if others feel that the process did not allow sufficient time or particular parties um, to go through um, uh, their evidence in, in full. So um, I, I would be personally very surprised that if um, the decision was made to go ahead with this, there wasn't at least somebody looking at whether it was re reviewed judicially. So um, uh, there may or may not be an opportunity for, the, for, for this to be revisited. Um, I don't think you know, the judicial review will be whatever it is, but I do think that um, the examining authority may find that they've, they've boxed themselves into a corner that they, they might struggle with themselves because there's a, this is the biggest road-based planning application probably since the M1, I, I would have thought. Um, so it's a, it, it, you know, by comparison to most development control orders, this is huge. And to put it into the same time scale as others which are relatively small, obviously by their nature, most of these are large, but this is huge, um, um, it is giving them a, a, a challenge. Yep. Um, just, just to say sort of uh, the, the last comment in, in response to your update, thank you for your update. 
uh, that I think it still would be useful for us to have. Monday we meetings. have lost sound at this end. Can you not hear me? Uh, I, I didn't hear the last part of Mark's statement, and neither did Laura, because she's shaking her head. Okay, well. Do you want to try speaking into the mic again, Mark, just for that last part of that statement? Chris, Laura, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, from which point did, did you not hear me previously, sorry? <laughs> I think it was only the last minute of what you said. Not much. Okay. Um, it was just really referring to the fact that um, you know, um, DCOs have a standard six-month timescale, no matter how complex the issue. And I think the examining authority will realise partway through that this is very complex, and therefore they will have their own pressures um, in concluding it within that time scale, and, and therefore it is possible, possible, uh, I wouldn't go any further than that, that there might be uh, an extension at a later date. Um, there's no provision under the Planning Act for that to happen, though, so it's very unlikely. It's never, ever been done in 120 applications, um, and some of them have been the same size as this. Um, Mark, is it is it okay if I was to add a couple of supplementary comments to what you very clearly explained? Yes, please. Okay. Um, just a couple of things. Um, Mark's obviously done a very clear exposition of, of, of the situation. Um, if members are interested, there are two key documents that we did submit early on after our re-engagement, which in many ways summarise the council's case. One is called the relevant representation or the relevant rep. It is about 30 pages and it does summarise the case. I can circulate it um, to Elaine if you like and she can circulate it to members. It is actually on the PINS website as Mark says. The other document at the same time on the 4th of May we submitted was what's called the PADS summary statement. PADS stands for Principal Areas of Disagreement. Now, whilst the Council have something like 300 issues in its Statement of Common Ground, which is not agreed and not signed, but it's published and part of the application, and we're still going through our comments on it, um, we were asked to summarise the key or the principal areas within that and we've cut it down to 150 issues, and it also is about 30 pages, but it sets out the issues quite clearly. So those two documents are quite handy. Um, I can send both of them to you in PDF form, um, and I can send you links so you can, you can circulate either. Uh, the second of three things I was hoping to say is that um, we are expecting what's called the Rule 8 letter, probably tomorrow, evening and that sets out the confirmed timetable the rule six was the draft timetable and the rule eight is the confirmed timetable um it, ca it can't be issued until tomorrow but it has to be issued kind of before the issue specific hearing which doesn't give it much time except tomorrow um and at that it is entirely possible that some of the dates of the examination deadlines going forward might change because they have hinted at that in their decision about there being no delay. Um, the principal document that the council will be submitting, well it has to submit now, which is on the examination deadline one, ED1, which is the um, local impact report. We are trying to keep it to about 120 odd pages and it will have a lot of appendices um, and it will set out, uh, there is a, a, a planning inspectorate advice note, number one, I think it might be, um, setting out the broad content of that and we're following it, but we are going into much more detail about the council's um, assessment of impacts and its case against the project. 
um, and that will go through the delegated governance process through Mark um, a little bit before the 18th. Um, we have got very little time compared with everybody else to submit this and of course we've got 70% of the route so it does make it quite difficult. Um, going forward, um, after we've submitted the local impact report, there are a series of issue specific hearings and examination authority written questions. Now the hearings are kind of semi-judicial. Um, only the examining authority can cross-examine unless they allow others to do it. Um, and the examining authority set out a number of questions. Now, in the past, Tideway, for instance, we had 609 questions. I remember that quite distinctly. Um, there were 2,000 for Sizewell. And this examining authority has said there should be less because they're trying to do a lot of it in the early pre-examination stages. But we don't know. And many of the questions will be for the applicant, National Highways. Some will come to the council. So our involvement after the local impact report will be attendance and taking part in those hearings, which we need to prepare for quite carefully, and in answering written questions. And that's what happens over the six months. It is exceedingly intense. <laughs> Having been through a few, it is the hardest most people have ever worked to get through one of these, particularly for something this large. That was really all, all I wanted to add, if that's OK. I don't know whether there's any questions on that. Thank you, Chris. Councillor Muldowney? Um, yeah, just to finish the comments um, from Mark's report. Thank you for that, uh, Chris. That does help. And I certainly would like to look at those documents or, or if you can provide the links. Um, just to make it easy. I mean, I have been on the Planning Inspectorate website. There's a lot of things on there and it's, it's, it's quite confusing. So if you could highlight those for us, that would be great. Um, the comment that I was going to make was that I still think it would be useful for us to have monthly meetings, even if we're only getting a short verbal update. Um, that, was my, that was my comment. Thank you. Just before I go over to Laura, I'd, I'd like to agree with the, the, the vice chair there. I think we, if there is business, we will we will meet. Um, but then we do have obviously the option if we don't have enough business that I think we did a few times in the last year that we, that we, um, we cancelled the meeting due to insufficient business. Uh, Laura Blake. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark and Chris, for the update. Um, apologies if this was covered in your update, Mark, but the sound was a little bit um, dodgy at times from this end. Um, I just wanted to make sure that any members of the public that might be watching and indeed members who may wish to take part themselves or advise any of the people in their areas. Um, on the 18th of July, it would be deadline one, which is when there is an opportunity for written representations, which will give members of the public the opportunity to put their concerns in writing if they either in addition to or if they don't wish to speak at the open floor hearings. So I just wanted to put that across to everyone just to make that perfectly clear. It's great to know what the council's focus is and what deadlines they have, but also um, as an action group and, and for the members of the public watching, I think it's nice that we also cover that aspect in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any other members of the task will have questions or comments? Councillor Spate. Uh, yeah, this is uh, probably a, a very uh, daft question, um, and, and the answer is probably known by everybody else in, in this room rather than me, but if I, uh, it's a, a query um, that came about, and probably Mark can answer it as, as well as anybody. I've uh, been talking to DP World, and you mentioned DP World earlier, earlier on, and they're very keen um, to press the case for the Freeport and talk about the, what the Freeport is going to bring to Thurrock and the interventions that that's going to have in and, and there's quite a lot of transport conversations took place um, including the possibility of new roads and improved rail links across the area and bear in mind you're going from Dagenham to Tilbury to 
DP World and, and obviously the Thames Enterprise Park. Uh, and forgive me if I should know, but, but I don't. Do you know how much the Freeport has become engaged in this process of the hearing, or are they sort of too late at the party? The Freeport as a body have not, um, as far as I'm aware, um, responded corporately, but the individual groups, particularly um, Port of Tilbury and DP World have. Um, we are now working with the Freeport both as the accountable body, now that it's been confirmed, although we're still awaiting for the memorandum of understanding from government on that. Um, but we're also now working as a partner, uh, so two aspects to Thorax involvement in the Freeport. And as part of that, um, uh, I do want to make sure that they are, um, uh, as, as a partner, are aware of what we're doing, supportive of us where it's appropriate for them to be, but equally we're, we're aware that generally they want to see investment in more infrastructure, but equally they want to make sure that um, there is mitigation around the local impact. Um, so I think we, we will seek to engage them as, as, as a Freeport board rather yeah. than as the individual components of that board more as we now engage with them as a partner um, in the process and making sure that um, nothing uh, gets in the way of us maximising the benefits of Freeport um, and, and, as you say, um, making sure that um, the uh, positives of additional capacity across the river are not outweighed by the negatives of um, restricted movement um, uh, parallel to the river. Yeah, it, it, my question came about because they were talking about, I believe the current DCO that, that London Gateway has um, is, is coming towards the end of its natural shelf life. Um, and they were talking to me about they looking at preparing a Freeport development concern. And whether that's just talk or whatever, I didn't know. But it, I just sort of wanted to know that what impact that would have, if any, um, that they effectively got their own planning rights for other bits. It, it, there's a bit of confusion as to who's going to be doing what uh, in my patch, which is why I'm asking this. Okay, I, I, I'm happy to, to put together a, a, a more detailed briefing from, f uh, as you say, a, 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 on a ward councillor basis. Um, we are working with um, um, DP World on uh, renewing their local development order as opposed to a development control order. Um, now, it, it, the, the, the jargon is, is lost on me very often, as, as much as so. Um, so yes, the, the original port um, was set up under a development control order, but a lot of what they do around the port is covered by a local development order, which effectively gives them outline planning consent uh, and, and allows them to, to progress more speedily with the implementation. Um, um, but I, as I say, what I'll do is um, I'll work with Lee Nicholson and arrange to give you a, a, a briefing on the wider issues around planning and the Freeport. Thank you. And anybody else that's interested in a similar briefing? It sounds, I think it would be useful. It's such a big thing for, for Farrock the Freeport and uh, yeah, I think it, or any information members can have on it would, would um, be means we're better equipped. Um, Laura Blake, did you have your hand up? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, not really on the DCO process, but just on the topic of ports and particularly Gateway Port um, or London Gateway. Can I just mention um, and sort of question what is the council doing in regards to the air and noise um, pollution monitors that are getting the base level for the LTC? in regards to the noise, which is obviously carrying extremely much further than the area that national highways are proposing to be assessing and monitoring for the LTC. Um, for example, you know, in all sit here, we're hearing the pile drilling from Gateway on a regular basis um, at all hours. Um, is that being picked up on the baseline? And what impact is that obviously going to have? Because it doesn't seem like that's going to be a good idea if that's considered the norm when in actual fact, our norm doesn't normally include such noisy pile drilling ongoing. 
it, it's a valid point. I don't have the answer, but it is. It has been. You're not the first person to raise it, so I, I will make sure. You're absolutely right that um, uh, we we have ab abnormal levels of noise as a result of, of the piling, um, and of course we'll see that again with the next phase. Um, but yes, we don't want that to be the benchmark. Um, so we, you, it's a valid point. We need to check. Um, whether that is being moderated uh, as part of the um, uh, assessment of noise. Thank you. I think that's a, a very good point. And, and also, I know there's lots of noise complaints, not just in Farrock and Essex, but also in Kent. Um, so if maybe you could work with your colleagues uh, across the, the river, so to speak, then um, they might be able to share some information that might help with that as well. Any other member wish to comment, Councillor Spate? Yeah, if I may, um, uh, yes, uh, piling has been the bane of the lives of those of us in Stamford of recent times. Um, and, and what has been interesting is in my interaction with the council on behalf of residents, um, so the, one of the answers that I've got back is, um, oh, it's not our problem, it's an environment agency problem, the noise. Um, and then you'd speak to the environment agency and they bat it back the other way. Um, None of which really matters when you're half past seven on a Sunday morning, you're getting thump, thump, thump. You don't really care who's dealing with it. Um, and there just seems to be a real lack of enforcement. Now the piling, we're gonna have to live with it. It's here, it's really annoying. The majority of people in the east of the borough that suffer from it are, they're prepared to suffer it at the moment. They would like a little bit more communication and they would like to know that it isn't going to happen again, or if and when it happens again, there is proper legislation and information in place to ensure that there are not breaches. Because this, this clearly is, is, is far and above and beyond what anybody expected when the planning permission was given. But it's a done deal now and it's there and nobody's saying you've got to stop it. Um, but we would just like to know in, in that part of the borough that it isn't going to happen again and certainly with the whole of the, 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 the Thames crossing route, the, you know, there's going to be a huge amount of, you look at, if, if it does happen, um, the viaducts, the overways, the whatever, there's going to be substantive amounts of piling involved in that. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that the people of Thurrock know that when a rule is laid down, that it is then enforced because we're pretty bad at enforcing our own rules. Anyone, any officer like to make a comment on that, on the piling and learning lessons now so we don't repeat things in the future? I, I think on the piling, um, I, I, we are monitoring that. There is agreement and I, I, I don't think we've been batting it back to the Environment Agency, but I'll happily take that out the room and discuss that with you. I think on the issue of dust uh, and noise, then uh, um, again, um, that is probably where we are saying that is the Environment Agency. But yes, we should uh, learn lessons. But ultimately, uh, you know, with a development control order, it is, it is the planning inspectorate that agrees what the planning conditions are and agrees how many of those the local authority has control over. And it is worth noting that in, in, in this particular instance, um, I think in part because um, you know, there are a number of local authorities, but we may not even get control of the reserve matters on the Lower Thames Crossing, and those might still sit with, um, with the planning inspectorate rather than locally. So it, it, that is another reason why it's important we raise these issues now. Um, and you're right, we, you know, we, we will make sure that um, uh, we, we fight as hard as we can to make sure we have local powers rather than um, those are taken away from us. Thank you. Any other member comment or question? Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. I was wondering if I might just be able to ask Laura a quick question, um, and if, 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 if I can be allowed. Uh, it's just obviously um, going back to the minutes again uh, from the last meeting. It's just really for my own education. Um, it's really regarding the wilderness uh, in South Ockendon, you know, the woodland. Um, and, and the minutes say that um, you're looking to establish the, uh, the long-established woodland by the Woodland Trust. Has there been any movement on that, or can you tell me at what stage you're at and maybe how long that might take? Or, you know, I mean, obviously, we can bring it to next meeting, but if you could give me a brief one, or I can contact you after the meeting. Laura, do you want to uh, come in there? 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, and just to any of the new members or indeed the existing members, um, our emails are always open at TCAG. If you want to contact us with any questions, please don't hesitate. We're always happy to discuss things. Um, it's shutting us up that you'll have a problem with. <laughs> um, in regards to the wilderness, um, yes, it is actually a new status, the long established woodland, and we are trying to find out at what point we can actually get an application in on that. Um, so it is ongoing and just to clarify that is one of the notes that I asked to be amended in the minutes because it is actually Natural England and not the Woodland Trust that would consider and potentially award such a status. Thank you Laura, I, don't, I, don't, I must confess I did miss that point but, uh, but thank you very much for that, thank you. Uh, Resident Representative Robert Quick. Thank you Chair. Um, can I just ask, probably Mark or Chris would best answer this, just for my own benefit and also for the benefit of any resident of this. Can you explain <coughs> the, exp the apparent contradiction between the DCO process pushing forward and what everybody's heard from the press that the project has been delayed two years? Um, Sorry. <laughs> It's Can I, it like it, did you not hear that? I did hear it, Robert. Thank you. Um, explaining it is difficult. I mean, um, there are two separate things going on here. When, um, when the uh, Secretary of State for Transport made the announcement, um, gosh, it was about three or four months ago now, um, he did say that the process for the DCO should continue, even though they are delaying construction for two years. Now, it was a fairly broad statement, um, and honestly, we don't yet know what delaying construction means. Do they mean, for instance, is it main construction? Is it, does it also include the enabling works? Um, we're not entirely clear, and I'm not sure national highways are yet. Um, so the DCO process continues, and the program the examination marks outlined after that has happened there is three months in which the planning inspectorate the examining authority have to make their recommendation report in confidence to the secretary of state so that would be the end of march uh, of 24. then um, the secretary of state has three months in which to make a decision uh, and that takes them to the end of june now there have been a number of occasions in the last year or two where the Secretary of State's decision, whether it's transport or um, one of the other departments, where the decision has been delayed. So there's no guarantee that the decision will come out at the end of June. Um, the two year delay also, we're not entirely certain um, when that begins. Does it begin at the point of the recommendation? Or does it begin at the point of the decision? Or has it already started? Um, so there's a lot of unknowns, as there often are with government statements, because they're broad political statements. Um, and we haven't yet got to the bottom of those details. Um, but it is very clear that the DCO is proceeding apace. Um, and after that process has taken place, who knows what will happen because by the end of June of next year, you are just a few months away from a general election. Um, so either a decision will be delayed or it will be made. But once it's made, I'm not sure any future government can change it. So there's a lot of unknowns there, Robert. I don't know whether that helps you. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks, Chris. Laura, did you have your hand up? Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, just based on what Chris was saying there, I don't know if it'd also be helpful just to mention to members that at one of the procedural meetings in, in the preliminary stages, uh, pre-examination stages, it was covered on the aspect that the um, roads policy or the national networks national policy statement as it's officially known is currently being um, consulted upon and that the decision is likely to be made on that and for it to come in before the end of the year is the plan and the examining authority have made it clear that if that 
is the case, then they will also consider the new policy. So that policy is obviously definitely worth keeping an eye on as well. And also just as, as an aside there as well, the Transport Select Committee have an inquiry into the strategic road investment and the LTC did come up and focus in that quite a bit at the hearings and the outcome of that hasn't yet been announced. So that's another thing to bear in mind and keep an eye on. Graham, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor, any other member or comment or question? Just looking around. Uh, Robert Quick. Yeah, sorry, Chair, thanks. Um, one other question. The, um, uh, the announcement fairly recently that um, uh, the smart motorway um, system was to be discontinued. Do we have any indication of how that will impact the, uh, the proposed route for the Lower Thames Crossing? Chris or Mark like to answer that one? Uh, Mark, do you want me to deal with it or are you going to deal with it? Chris, I'm happy for you too. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, the National Highway's position is this is not a smart motorway. Um, and the government announcement was to stop all new building of smart motorways. Um, but they are continuing, my understanding is they're continuing with ones that have started and they will complete them. Um, they have put in m more um, emergency stopping areas and they've colored them yellow, if I remember rightly, having passed a few. Um, there are elements of the LTC, which is called the A122 now, or it will be if it comes ab about, um, that, are, that do contain the principles of smart motorways. And we have challenged National Highways about that. Um, they maintain that it is an all-purpose trunk road. In other words, on normal A roads throughout the country, there are no stopping places, there are no um, hard shoulders, and they maintain that that's the case here, even though some of the design standards um, that they're using for this all-purpose trunk road are smart motorway standards. And there is some conflicting uh, guidance, uh, technical guidance notes. Uh, we will ultimately be raising it in some of our comments on the local impact report. Um, it is a little bit fuzzy, to say the least. Um, and we are continuing to push for a clearer response from National Highways. I'm not sure if that helps you, but it's it's all I can offer, I'm afraid. Thank you, Chris. I think National Highways, um, if we look at this, if it does ever go ahead, um, it will look very much like a motorway. It will smell very much like a motorway. Um, so it is effectively will be a motorway and we'll have smart yeah. motorway by stealth. Um, I yeah. think sure members of the task force would agree. Um, we've discussed that in the past. Uh, Laura Blake. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it was just to add in on from what Chris said on a lot of the work that we've done as a group and the evidence does show in the DCO documentation that there is no hard shoulder in common with a smart motorway. It's actually using the smart motorway technology and importantly as well, it does actually say that the road is coded as a three lane motorway with the exception of the southbound section between the M25 until just past the A13. So all of those things do actually suggest that it is a smart motorway by stealth. Um, that is something that we've been pushing on. And I did also notice that that is one of the items on the agenda for the issue specific hearing one on the project definition that the examining authority um, appear to be looking to ask questions on on Wednesday. So um, that will be something to watch out for as well. Thank you, Laura. Any other member comment or question? Um, just for anyone that's that's watching this on the 19th of June, just a reminder that the minor refinement consultation ends at 23.59 this evening. So you can go on to your favourite search engine and find that if you want to give your views on the, the latest minor refinements that National Highways um, are, are seeking your, your view on. Um, and with that, it is 1903. That concludes the business of the meeting and I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.
ਆਪਣੇ ਇਸ 